you just see these lines of stones and they just look like lines and you see the waves pounding in you don't realize the huge amount of time that went into putting these lines here but i don't mind that because in a way it, the energy is stored in the work it's been here for probably 20 years now it's extraordinary to come back to something and find it still uh, sort of visually mo it's moving emotionally, but it's moving for the eye. Nobody had ever done anything like this before, with local people, with communities, in the wild. A lot of the people that come here probably don't appreciate the significance of the, uh, the land sculpture or the landform. They come here and appreciate the landscape and the, uh, the picturesqueness of it, the, the robust beauty. But it's when they uh, delve into it and ask questions that they can discover the significance, which I think makes it more interesting. And, uh, it's, it's, it's what Portland is all about. I think it shifted things a lot. It's now commonplace to find art not on plinths in town squares or in places. It was the start of something. Milestones project emerged from our thinking that it would be great to challenge people to look closely at their place in a different way. And the idea of encouraging local folk to commission sculpture for their place um, seemed to us a really interesting idea. To get people to actually engage with artists, explaining to them why they loved and valued their place. I mean, it was a combination between common ground who were interested in local people and people who were actually on the spot. There was Margaret Somerville and uh, Joanna Morland who were on the administration side. But I'd worked on Portland for oh, a long time and I knew a lot of masons and quarrymen. And it was that contact with the, the Portlanders that, that sort of gave life to it. The fact that there was a rapport here meant that John's ideas were lifted, but also people moved away from want wanting something literal. It took some time for the ideas to develop. The original drawings just showed, well, basically lines on the land, and curving lines with a sort of rhythm and an energy, and these became terraces. What they got had a literal side to it, but also many other dimensions as well, a real piece of poetry in the landscape. Five different walls and each wall is made with a different stratum of the uh, Portland stone and every wall is made in a different way because of the stone it's made out of. The idea began to emerge to explore Portland stone in its five different faces. At the top you have the slat and cap then you have roach, and then you have wit bed, and you have base bed. One of the things which wouldn't have been right would be uh, solid masonry built walls with, uh, with mortar and concrete foundations. That would have just added weight, would have, uh, would have not have helped the engineering. Uh, solution for the area, but having these um, organic shapes uh, with uh, effectively dry stone wall constructions 
uh, in um, a wavy form. Um, it gave, gave a flexibility to it and, and made it uh, a very worthwhile um, addition to the land stability, actually, as well as being an artwork. And it's, it's unusual these days, these days to combine art with engineering, but here we, uh, John has done it extremely successfully, in my view. It was a, a luxury, really, to be able to spend so much time in one place thinking about it, like a very, very extended drawing. It was like making a drawing. hillside had paths already and so I wanted to create lines that were complementary to those paths. The local school came down at one point and all the kids lined up in a sort of wriggly line with other kids up on the top of the hill where I worked with them to decide or back a bit, forwards a bit and we sort of drew with these lines of people and then once we had that we put stakes in the ground and then the army dug the trench through. Then we had uh, um, Manpower Services Commission. Then we had students. We had some uh, prisoners from the Young Offenders Institute. They were very good, a few at a time, with an officer. And uh, spent many, many hours just, just out here. always have a pile of stone near us and build it up. They face the sea, and, and they are to do with that, that kind of relationship with the sea. There's a rhythm, like the rhythm in the sea. The underlying principle of Chisel is that it was always next to the sea. The sea's been its friend, and the sea's been its enemy. The, the village of Chisel has, uh, has suffered an awful lot of flooding um, in, in, its, in its history. 1978 and again in 1979, just uh, two months, three months later, there were, there, were, there were two very, very big storms. One was a, a storm, uh, a conventional storm wave, which was, very, was a very rough sea, and the sea came over and caused very big devastation. But uh, an even worse storm came in uh, 1979, um, February, and uh, it was a swell wave. It was a fairly calm sea, but swell waves were generated far out into the Atlantic from Newfoundland, in fact, storm there, and uh, they increased in size and intensity. Um, and these great big swell waves came and lurched over the beach in massive rollers, took everybody by surprise. Um, it just wasn't predicted at all, and uh, that one caused absolute devastation. That's what led to some of the sea defence works. I believe that Chisel itself, the village to Chisel, is um, more protected and is safer than it's ever been in its very, very long history. So I think they, they wanted to do something to, to celebrate the existence and the continuing existence and the future of Chisel, and here we have something which um, you know, marks that. As places become more, more conventional, as less people go fishing and more people just go to chisel as sort of residential accommodation. It's a reminder of the, the fact that chisel was linked with the sea and always will be. John's work on the Isle of Portland, particularly this work on, on chisel, is 
is a milestone of its own. Um, it's a really important integrated piece. It's integrated into the community, it's integrated into the land. I think if at any point uh, someone was to say we want to build here or whatever else, um, there ought to be a huge outcry from the local people but also from the art world because it's a turning point. The important thing is that there are people locally who have taken a pride in, in maintaining it. If it wasn't looked after, it would be a wreck by now. This grass doesn't stay like this by nature. There are no goats or sheep. It has to be cut. And the walls would be covered in weeds. And the, the kind of uh, gorse and all that would just be everywhere. But there, there are now a group of people who look after it, who have events on it, local people now have adopted it and make sure it stays and proud of it. I'm proud of them. Yeah, the Cheshire Community Trust is, is doing a, a great job and I think if they, they or their successors, anybody that, like them in the future, uh, will continue to take a pride in it, it'll, um, yeah, it'll be here for a, a long, long time to come.